didn't already introduce myself. I'm Cheryl Moyer. Um, at the end of all of this, I will have um, some information about the Audubon Club in Mount Pleasant. So um, I'll hand out one of those flyers at the end so you can see our upcoming programs. And if you're interested in coming up to Mount Pleasant, it's a great opportunity. Uh, but today we're going to focus in on, again, fall birding, feeding, and care. So, oh, oh, so I'm not used to the, to the touch screen and the PowerPoint things. I've done this three times this summer. You'd think I'd get used to this. Okay, so who migrates? And we're going to talk just briefly about um, who's leaving Michigan, who's coming into Michigan. Um, like I've said before, Michigan has well over 300 different species of birds kind of coming through at different points. Um, it's the cool thing about where we are. We're at, we're at kind of a juncture of two my primary migrating um, paths that come up through the Great Lakes. And so this time of year, you're getting birds heading south. You're getting birds heading north. Um, birds that have been summering up in the Arctic are now going now to come down here and hang out. Your, um, your juncos, your dark-eyed juncos, familiar winter bird, um, the snowy owl, um, the numbers from those guys range um, periodically. The red pole, common red pole, you'll see those in fields. Um, the uh, snow bunting, those are the ones that you'll see all along the roadside that look like big white waves fluttering in the, in the winter snow, just beautiful. Um, we've got a uh, broad-shouldered hawk, um, also a migratory kind of comes through in different numbers. And then this guy, the evening grosbeak. And you had, Heather, you had a bunch of evening grosbeaks yeah. at your feeder last year. And so these are, these are kind of one of those elusive birds. And so one of the things we're going to talk about today is how to hopefully draw them in. I've never had an evening grosbeak at my feeder. Um, there was a, a feeder in Midland that had them um, through most of the summer, actually. So just a cool bird, comes from, comes from up north. Who's leaving? A lot of birds. Um, you know, we see the, the, the V formations of the Canada geese, kind of the harbinger of fall, but there are a lot of different birds leaving, a lot of fall birds leaving. Um, your canvas backs, your buffalo heads, your pintail ducks, um, mallards to some degree, wood ducks to some degree, um, your warblers, we've got the common red, yellow throat here, your thrushes, this would be the brown thrashers, the wood thrushes, um, a lot of the, uh, the the seed eaters, the nut eaters, the um, the, the insect eaters, because their food source is going to be uh, drying up. The red-winged blackbirds, I think they're one of the last to vacate. It seems like I always see at least one red-winged blackbird in my feeders late October, and when they leave, everything gets really quiet. I think it's like all of a sudden the red-winged blackbirds are gone. And the feeders are, I don't know, the air is silent, just like when they first come back in the spring. To me, that's the harbinger of spring, when you hear that first red-winged blackbird, um, and then everybody gets really loud. Um, and then a lot of, um, a lot of different uh, seabirds, birds of prey, your, um, your ospreys head for warmer climates. And then we've got the remaining, your cardinals, blue jays, nuthatches. Um, the red-tailed hawk is usually here year-round again, over 300 species coming and going. Boom! So, a little breakdown of the fall migration. September, your raptors start cruising in and out. Um, dabbling ducks, those are the ones that kind of die, you see diving upside down. They'll um, be eating um, plants that are under the surface of the water. Um, different gulls, you know, we always think of the gulls as being, um, you know, a common fixture, but they migrate. Um, my gull identification is terrible. Um, songbirds, your thrushes, ruby-throated hummingbirds. Um, the males will, of the ruby-throated hummingbirds will actually start migrating um, as early as July. So this time of year, um, a lot of what you're seeing are the females and the young of the year. And so you'll, you might see um, a few of the males, but a lot of them, just as soon as they're done with the breeding season, they head back south. Well, they, they are just wild at the feeders right now. <laughs> Yes, they are. You see one at a time before that, now you see four, five, six, and they're just chasing each other. Go oh, cool. Wild little. 
I don't know what. <laughs> well, and I wonder, because I've been noticing that too with my feeders and in the yard. And I'm wondering if maybe part of it is their sibling groups, um, nest mates. And so it's, you know, they're kind of maybe. playing around mm -hmm. like little kids do. Well, I, I personify the Ruby Joy <laughs> hummingbird because they're so cool. You know, the, the feeders have like four or five, six yeah. holes, but they won't let two there at the same no, time. No, no. Oh. No. no, they're very territorial too, um, especially the males. Uh, when they start doing a lot of feeding later in the fall or later in the summer and leading into fall, it's, it's preparation for migration. They've got such a long flight, they really need to stock up on their food. And That's so maybe what somebody told me once, because they do get wild like yeah. that, and you see so many where all summer long, I never see more than one at a time. Yeah. Right now, I'm seeing lots of them. Well, and that would, that would make sense that, you know, we're heading into September, and so they're probably starting to um, think about that push south and you know if you've seen video probably seen videos on on Facebook um, or have friends that live down along the Gulf Coast um, they'll have feeders set up of hummingbirds and you'll see you know a, a hundred hummingbirds coming in before they make that dash across across the um, across the Gulf it's pretty impressive you know they really need to fatten it up. It seems impossible how those little teeny things could have enough in them yeah. to be able to fly like that. And it seems like I remember seeing somewhere that they um, they get you get such a mass of the hummingbirds down along the south that they actually pick them up on Doppler radar when they're when they're getting ready to migrate. And so just to imagine have that much biomass of these little no. tiny <laughs> tiny birds. And some of the bats will do that too. They'll pick there's such a big mass of them that you'll pick them up on um, on the Doppler. So we don't get quite as many here. That's still it's pretty cool. Um, so heading into fall, uh, you've got um, diving ducks, um, northern finches, sparrows um, coming up from the north. We get a kind of a swamp over of the sparrows. You start seeing some of the white-throated sparrows, yellow-throated sparrows, or white-crowned yellow-throat. Um, the uh, common sparrows are here. Um, different northern finches. Um, house finches are here typically year-round, but you'll start getting the, um, the red poles, the um, pine siskins, and um, again, following the food source. They spend most of their time up in Canada. Um, November, your diving ducks are, are heading, heading out. Um, sea ducks. This is one of the cool things about the Great Lakes is, you know, as we come through with the migrations, we will occasionally get um, sea ducks that you typically might only see in Maine or somewhere along the East Coast that kind of come in because they get sucked along that migration pattern. Um, we've had Harlequin duck sightings um, in the, over by Bay City area a couple of years ago. There were a couple other, every once in a while we'll get like an eider coming through. So you know, every once in a while sea ducks come in and um, or they'll be here in the summer and they'll be heading out because you know it's uh, Lapland longspurs, those are kind of a cool sparrow looking bird move through. As snow buntings arrive, um, northern owls begin to make their way through the UP. Um, the uh, snowy owl, the um, hawk owl, uh, we'll be getting different um, short-eared owls, long-eared owls, again kind of migrating through north and south in November. and. So that's what's coming through, and where to look for some of these things. Um, this is, let's see if I can get these links to work. Bear with me for a minute because my use of technology is sketchy at best. Um, the Detroit River Hawk Watch and the um, Mackinac Straits Raptor Watch are two great resources for, um, for seeing different raptors in migration. Um, the uh, Mackinac Straits Raptor Watch, especially um, in the spring, they have a big raptor festival where they're watching these birds coming in. And um, part, of the, uh, part of the cool thing about the Mackinac Straits is you get different wind currents coming through and the birds will ride them north and south. And so if you're up in the Mackinac Straits during migration in the fall or in the spring, um, you can see um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different hawks 
and um, eagles would get, golden eagles would come into the state this time of year. Um, there was a golden eagle spotted um, pretty regularly last year over by Lake Isabella and the Waveman area. I never saw him. I went looking for him one day and, and just missed him. But, um, you know, they're around. So again, they come in through um, and riding these, these air currents through the straits. And the Straits of Mackinac is a great place to use. Um, plus, you get to go to Mackinac, which is always a good thing. All right, come on, Lake Burke. times. Okay, so we'll take a look at the Mackinac Straits Raptor Watch and this is a really cool, this is a really cool link besides they're just they're going to their festival. Um, they've got uh, different news about raptors, who's coming through, and it's not just they've got raptor banding in the spring, island count, numbers, um, information about different migrations. These are spring migrations. Uh, migration draws to a close. Again, this is in all information about spring migration. Um, Long-tailed ducks are one of the one of the um, kind of unusual birds that we get migrating through. And again, this is all part of the spring migration. But they give you a nice little update. So one of the cool things about this site is if you're not familiar about who's migrating when or what birds there are or what the numbers are, how many are going through or what you could possibly see, um, look at some of their summaries. Um, you know, check out some of the, ch check out some of the festivals. Um, they've got the research and data. This thing's a little bit slow. There we go. So research and data so far um, in 20, so 29, and this was 2019, uh, 22,000 red tail hawks. 374 golden eagles in, in 15. And so we get things like um, the uh, great gray owl kestrels coming through, uh, red morph um, <laughs> screech, long eared owl. What, what's that one? This is a long eared owl. Oh, yep, yeah. right, long eared. Yeah. Good name. <laughs> but there's a breakdown of the 2020. Um, who they're finding, broad-shouldered hawks, bald eagles, turkey vultures, red-tailed hawks, peregrine falcons, cooper's hawks, sharp shin hawks, golden eagles, harriers, kestrels, ospreys, and they give you all the different counts. And if you want to visit. You can look at what water, what counts are taking place weather, accommodations, count sites, and then events. Oh, check out some of these events. I think a lot of people don't realize the, the um, amount of raptors that we get coming through the area. And so different speaker series. And again, this is all up in Mackinac. It's a great resource to help you um, just open up a world of birdie. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, we've got the Detroit River Hawk Watch. And the Detroit area has a pretty prolific um, bird watching. Um, you know, you wouldn't think of an urban area as being, um, you know, well known for, for birding, but um, there are a lot of cool opportunities. And again, they give you the news, the different day summaries. They do hawk dot calls a little bit differently. Um, you know, they load the different sightings in, who they're seeing, um, migration brief, who's coming through, 
hit the south end, the little opposite end of the spectrum. A um, little bit of history, some of their partners. So, all right, back out of that. So that's a cool, cool resource to use. And then another one, um, Michigan's important bird areas. Oh, hold on. Michigan, this is the Audubon with the Michigan um, Audubon.org. This is the primary um, Audubon site, but it gives you state by state. And so with Michigan, um, some different places to go birding and where to look, um, what they're doing, different bird guides to use, um, different apps. Come on. So this link, um, audubon.org, important bear, bird areas by state, and you just look for Michigan, and this gives you, and again, we've got a list down here. I don't know if there's a lot to throw at you. Um, if at the end of this, if anybody would like any of these links, I'd be happy to write them down, um, or if you'd like any of this information emailed, just um, let me know, I'll give you my email, and happily send you some of the stuff. This is a great resource we've got. Um, uh, Port Huron, Hawk Watch, um, Sini National Wildlife Refuge, um, the Saginaw Bay, Talos Bay area has some great sites for birding, um, and there's some really interesting birds hanging out in some of those areas. Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge, this, that's not that long of a drive, and um, if you've never been over there, it's actually right off of um, 127, heading south, kind of the out of Ithaca, and there are bald eagles, a variety of, um, I think there's some eagle nests somewhere in that area. Um, there's a variety of different wild waterfowl coming through um, and resident as well. Um, they were seeing some uh, breeding sand, or not sandhill cranes. Um, uh, wow, totally drew a blank on the endangered crane, the um, whooping crane. crane, thank you. <laughs> They had a couple, last year had a couple of um, breeding pairs of whooping cranes. So, and um, some students from uh, an Audubon group were pretty excited to see that. So, you know, Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge, pretty close. Shiawassee um, River State Game Area, again, another um, great one to see. So, and there's 102 different sites on this, 102 different links that I'm not even gonna try, <laughs> try and go through right now because it would take us hours. I'd be happy to write down all of these resources. But if you want to get out and go birding, um, pull up a map, pull up a site, and head out. Download a couple of apps and just go. The fall is a great time to go birding too because um, the insects count tends to be lower. So you're not you know, swatting bugs the whole time. The weather's a little bit cooler. Um, warblers are a little bit tough to identify this time of year because they're um, you know, in their fall plumage and not quite as pronounced, but for seabirds, for different hawks, for, um, for the different owls, for, uh, um, okay, the different ducks, again, yeah, cool stuff, cool stuff to go look for. Okay, um, and then Michigan's, uh, and I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to click on this, but I'm happy to happily do this for you um, if you're interested. There's a Michigan Birdings Trail link as well. And so just Google in Michigan birding trails and gives you a lot of outdoor options. Um, another cool one, finally, before we move out of you know where to look, um, Whitefish Point does a lot of bird banding uh, and different bird counts, and they have a really cool page. So if you just type in Whitefish Point Bird Observatory, um, they'll take you to all sorts of links, follow them on social media, um, they will post when some of the first birds are coming through or who they're catching and banding. They do a lot of night captures of different owls, um, solid owls, um, um, great horns, screeches, 
they usually have an, have a, an idea of when that very first snowy owl is coming through because they get a lot of that stuff for it's a cool, cool site. So Whitefish Point, and you can visit up there as well. Questions about some of this stuff? The migrants, migrants, migrant birds, he's coming through. Oh crap, again, if you're interested in this information, I'd be happy to get you the links. All right, so um, now on to that feeding portion of the show. So preparing for winter and next year, um, the big thing you can do to, to help out your birds, um, besides the, the feeders and everything, is put down the rakes and stop doing the yard work in the fall. Um, when I, I know, right? <laughs> when I first heard this, I'm like, sweet. My laziness was actually environmentally friendly because I just, I, I hate raking leaves. And so I just started putting it off because I, I hate it. Um, there's nothing worse than going into your garden and pulling gross slimy tomato plants down after the frost has hit and it's just, everything is so slimy and wet in the fall. And so I just would leave it because, well, who wants to do that? And I noticed that, and before, you know, this was a thing, so I'm going to put myself on the cutting edge. My, again, my laziness is playing off, paying off. Um, before this was a thing, I did notice, though, that I was seeing more um, diversity in songbirds coming through in the fall. Um, like for years, I was trying to get common red poles at my feeder, never had a red pole come in. Went out in the garden one day, and there they were in my garden, eating tomato seeds, eating um, all the weeds that I got tired of weeding and pulling and just let to go to seed. Um, they were on the dead sunflower stalks, and so they were in my yard, just not in my feeder. Same with, um, I was getting pine siskins coming through. Um, right now I've got a lot of wrens in my garden for some reason and a lot of hummingbirds because I plant a lot of flowers along with the vegetables. But um, it was providing as we went into fall and those really first few cold, cold days, a lot of feeding opportunities for the birds. And then as we get through into spring and um, through winter and back into spring, it provides leaf litter for things like the robins that maybe did leave or the ones that are still there, something to scratch through. Um, I was seeing a lot of brown thrashers in my, in my gardens where a lot of leaf litter was because they're insect eaters and so they're going to be pawing through and digging for whatever is in there. Um, the ground might stay a little bit warmer so you might, it might fall a little bit faster. Um, I don't know about that. There were times I've seen it a little bit frozen. But um, the birds were more active at picking through that. So you don't necessarily have to, you know, have to rake your leaf. Um, leaving things like black-eyed Susans, coneflowers, um, anything that's got seed heads, the, a lot of the birds are going to eat. Goldfinches love those things. Uh, and so it just provides a quick snack, quick meal for them. Um, plus they look cool when the frost hits the, the dead plants. Oh, it's just it's beautiful. They get all sparkly. Um, it, as it breaks down in the soil, it provides, it's beneficial to the soil as well. You know, you don't need to constantly spray things and, and um, scatter pesticides and herbicides and all that stuff on your yard. Let, na let nature do it. And so, you know, just leave the stuff to break down. Um, if possible, as you're preparing your yard, um, put in a brush pile. Now, I know <laughs> a big giant brush pile is probably not the best idea for your neighbors and they might think you're crazy. So if you want, you can do aesthetically pleasing brush piles. Um, if you've got a got a fence maybe close to your feeders um, lean some branches that you you know maybe cut them specifically for that area lash them to the fence um, put some grape wrap some grapevines in there and just create sort of a, a little bit of a lean-to shelter for the birds um, a friend of mine did this because they were having um, a sharp shinned hawk hunting their feeders religiously this thing just sat basically sat up and just started picking off songbirds left and right and so to protect them from the sh from the hawk they decided to build a brush pile up against one of their fences and they took um, some pine poles and just kind of you know rough pine poles probably about that big around leaned them through and then just started weaving um, branches um, the uh, using the grapevines before they started to dry up um, as lashing and then just threw some brush on top. Oh, the little songbirds loved it because the sharkshin hawk would come through and they go zipping into there and they just sit there and wait. 
until he was gone. And it was, it was uh, provided a great birding opportunity for them to see how this hawk hunts and would try and get these little birds, but also to kind of see the little birds. And they also noticed that um, in the brush pile, um, small woodpeckers uh, were, would put seeds, would try and drill seeds <laughs> into some of the lawn, into some of the little poles. Um, and we're getting, they were getting a lot of bird diversity in the spring when some of the bark was peeling off the, the brush the birds were using it as nesting material. And so, you know, you're creating a lot of possibility, right? Just gives them a little bit of shelter. Um, skip the chemicals. Grass clippings and mulch, mulch leaf litter provide more nutrition. Also encourages um, native species. Fertilizers help encourage non-native plants to grow. And again, non-native, the tough plants like that, the non-native stuff, the invasive species, don't often provide a great food um, crop for the native birds. And is, this is a good time to hit the nurseries. You know, um, there's a, the link here, Audubon's Native Plant Database. I'm not going to click on it because we know <laughs> how that's going to end up. But Audubon's Native Plant Database, um, you enter your zip code in and they will tell you what um, trees and shrubs and um, perennials you can plant this time of year to provide a food source for the birds. It's not going to be immediate. The thing about creating a, a bird friendly yard is looking long term. You're not going to have this instant turnover of, hey, I planted a couple shrubs and did this and that, you know, boom, why aren't there birds here? Well, it takes them a while to find it. It takes the plants time to grow. You know, the more mature the trees, um, the better the, fr the food source. And so look at what sorts of trees and shrubs and vines are best suited for your area. Look at how long it takes them to reach maturity and plant a, plant a small variety of them. And you don't need a big yard to do it. You know, you can just have a small space and you know, maybe you've got a, maybe you've just got, maybe you've got a yard a si the size of this table. You can still look for native species that are going to fit in, you know, maybe there are different types of shrubs that will grow a certain way and then you can underplant with shade loving berries or, you know, there's so many different possibilities. Now, maybe you plant up with different vines. There are a lot of vines that a lot of the songbirds love. Um, things like wild grape, which great for songbirds, but it also tends to take over and you'll be battling wild grape. So I'm on the fence with that one. but. You know, there's so many different things that you, you can do. It doesn't have to be a big space, but think, you know, long term. But look for look for shrubs and trees for suits food sources. And long down the road, it also takes the place of the brush piles because now you've got you know shelter in the different canopies, the different vines that the birds can um, hide in. So don't clean your yard. Buy plants. That's just that's just good advice. Don't clean your yard and buy plants. I'm going to tell my husband that that's my new mantra. <laughs> Don't clean the yard, buy plants. Actually, buy plants. Don't clean the yard. Anyway, it's a whole other issue. Okay, so feeding. Once you've got the birds there, besides the, um, the uh, different plants. Um, so feeding tips. Feeding birds in the winter provides them with additional nutrition. But it's a little bit more than just simply buying a bag of bird seed and tossing it out for the birds. Um, birds have different tastes. And one of the things, one of the problems I think with feeding birds is a lot of the bird seed is just filled with crap that nobody eats. Um, a lot of those bulk bird seeds, the, the, the more economical bird seeds um, are filled with um, Oh, millet, white millet, and nobody really eats them except, well, turkeys. And so if you've got a flock of turkeys, they might come in and eat it. Um, the deer, when they get hungry enough, will come through and, and clean it out. Um, my dogs, too, which just is never a good thing to have your dog feeding a lot of millet. Um, it acts as a laxative and it's just bad. So, um, you be, that firsthand. <laughs> What's that? I said I've witnessed that firsthand. <laughs> yeah, oh. <laughs> Why do they do that? Yep. Um, so it's a yes, ma'am. Speaking of the deer will eat it, but I have really it's quite a small patio. But last winter I had three huge deer on my patio, yeah. and one of them had the bird feeder, had his nose <laughs> tipped up like this, and it probably was just like a 
funnel down right into the ground. Yeah. <laughs> Hurry. They were, they were all too many. I didn't like that, and he took one of the railings out of my patio, too. But <laughs> well, last winter was a, was a really tough winter for the deer. It must have been. I've never seen that before. I had a couple of fawns that were doing the same thing. I had um, uh, I'd moved a lot of my bird feeders up onto the porch, and I had two fawns that were coming up. They would go, they would go around a fence and then come up onto the porch to eat from my, my platform feeder that the squirrels had broken. And so it was left with this just little platform that the cardinals got nothing. And then they also came up and were eating my, um, all my holiday decorations. I put a bunch of pine boughs and things like that, and the deer were just stripping everything. So it was, it was a tough, and, but with like the millet and things like that, yeah, the deer, the deer will, will eat it. Um, you wanna be careful um, I know there's uh, feeding bans in a lot of counties um, because of uh, chronic wasting disease. And um, I know some sites have, and some people have gotten into trouble with the DNR for putting out a lot of food and then drawing in deer. Now it's, I mean, you can't be out in the middle of the night trying to chase them off your porch if they're going to eat your feeders. And so, you know, they might come in and clean things up. But just, you know, be mindful of that as you're putting, putting out food for the birds, what are the deer going to eat them? can always control what they're going to eat. But um, if you choose foods that are a little bit more specific to the bird's needs, there's going to be less waste for the deer and your dogs <laughs> to come through. And so the big one is the um, black oil sunflower seeds. That's kind of a favorite for just about everybody. Um, that's, uh, we've got this lovely shot here of a feeder full of the evening grow speaks. They love the black oil, oil sunflower seeds on a nice platform feeder. Now, Heather, did you have them on the ground or in a platform um, feeder? They were on the ground below the two feeders, so there was a lot of, you know, cast off. Yep. Because one of my feeders is a tray and it gets spilled all the time yep. onto the ground. Yep. So. And creating an area um, on the ground like that is a great way to feed um, these, these types of birds, morning doves as well, like to have kind of a flat area. And so, you know, when you're creating a bird feeding space, doesn't have to be all hanging feeders. You can, you know, clear an area of snow, keep it clear, and cast the bird, bird seed out. Um, but black oil sunflower seed, woodpeckers, juncos, finches, I mean, again, pretty much everybody loves the black oil sunflower seed. So have that as your primary go-to food. Um, peanuts, either whole shell or in pieces, don't get the salted. Um, the the uh, whole peanuts, I get in the winter because I love watching the Blue Jays fight over them. It's like a little bird fight club over there. And so um, I'll just toss them out and watch them all come in. Every once in a while a squirrel will get one. Um, they like them. And the price point's a little, I don't know, kind of half, half six of one, half dozen of the other in terms of cost. Um, squirrels also like them. Um, I've got a tube feeder that um, uses uh, little peanut halves. And I use that this time of year. The woodpeckers like it and draw out the pieces. Um, it's generally squirrel proof. I mean, the squirrels will use it if they have absolutely nothing to eat. But for the most part, they leave it alone. The woodpeckers love it. Um, some of the um, cardinals will kind of pick at it occasionally. You want to be careful, though, um, with using peanut feeders this time of year. You want to check them because they can clump and get moldy, so you always want to be sure you're maintaining your feeders. Um, if I've got my peanut feeder out this time of year and it rains, um, I'll just dump the peanuts out for the birds to eat and then um, bring the feeder in to dry and just refill it. That way it keeps it nice and clean. Carol, will they eat moldy? No. Food they well, I'm sure they will, but you don't want to, you don't, you want to make sure that you're not giving yeah. them any moldy food. Um, so check it, store your foods in airtight containers, um, bins, bags, you know, just okay. again, double check it. Um, check it when you buy it too. Every once in a while I've gotten, especially late in the season um, or, or late summer coming into fall, I've gotten bags that have been kind of funky because I think they've been sitting. And so the, um, the seed was clumpy and I didn't take a chance. Um, so that doesn't happen very often. Most of the time, it's you know they go through it pretty quickly. But you want to make sure that the food is is good. You don't want them to get sick. Um, they can get diseases, different diseases of, in the beaks. They can get um, uh, there's an eye um, issue for some birds that's going around that's um, 
more related to um, bird concentration than what they're eating, but I want to make sure that you keep everything kind of clean. Um, and that actually works well into the, the point about the Niger thistle. So this is your finches, your pine siskins, um, and thistle feeders can get kind of clumpy and moldy, and so you want to be very careful of that. Um, I like the sock. Um, uh, most bird stores um, now sell the, the thistle in the sock. You can get more finches on the sock, and when the sock starts to look funky, um, I just throw them all out. Um, sometimes they break down anyway, but that way I'm not dealing with thistle feeders that are kind of weird and clump clumpy. I've had some thistle feeders that were so tight that they're almost impossible to clean, and I just, and again, ended up pitching them. So. Um, you want to keep them clean. But that brings me your finches, your siskins, your red poles. Um, cracked corn, morning doves, squirrels, turkeys. Um, and a, a cracked corn is another one that goes in a lot of bird seed, bulk bird seed mixes that not a lot of people eat, and not a lot of birds eat. So, you know, unless you've got a ton of morning doves, um, cracked corn, keep it to a minimum. Um, and then safflower seed is another one, cardinals and juncos like those. Uh, and then suet provides um, either suet cakes or rendered beef fat. Um, this time of year, I just get, I'm just using regular suet cakes that I get at the, at the pet store. Um, the, uh, I like to use the orange flavored one because for some reason my Orioles have, they don't want the oranges right now. They like the orange flavored suet and I still like to see the Orioles. So I put out the orange flavored. Um, they're fine. They're nice. They get a little melty this time of year. In the winter, I, sw I switch to um, the, the beef fat. It's a little bit easier to, to store, just to keep it in the freezer. Um, it holds up well, and for some reason, the Pileated Woodpeckers love the beef fat as opposed to the suet cakes that you buy at the store. Uh, I don't know what it is, but last winter was the first time I switched to the beef suet, and I had more Pileated Woodpeckers coming into my feeder and just going nuts. They would strip, if there was any meat in there, it strips some of the meat off. And um, you can also create um, little crumbles once it, you know, once it kind of thaws out and gets kind of squishy. Break it up into little crumbles, refreeze it, and then throw it out for the bluebirds. Great, great resource for that. Questions about some of the food? Now, what to do about those poor fruit and insect eaters, like the robins and the bluebirds, and also cedar waxwings. Um, kind of a side note, as I was researching this, and when I googled, what do robins eat in the winter, I kept getting all these sites that talked about putting out things like cheese for the robins. And I'm thinking, what? Well, I, yeah, I was, <laughs> really? Cheese? And so then I'm googling, well, what kind of cheese do robins like? It turns out, that um, we have American robins and we have European robins. And I think in the back of my mind, I knew this, but when I was first doing the Google search, I completely forgot. And I'm thinking, why are robins eating cheese? And what kind? Are they Wisconsin robins? Do they, <laughs> I mean, are they Packer fans? And what kind of cheese? And no, it's not our robin. So don't, don't put cheese out for our robins. But in all other forms of food, they do like the same things. So. Um, robins are not going to eat out of traditional feeders. They're not going to eat the bird seed that you put out. If you want to set up and, you know, have been seeing robins over the last couple winters and you want to set up some feeding, um, the first thing to think about is, again, going back to the point about planting in the fall, plant some small shrubs and trees to, you know, down the road provide food. Um, cherries, choke cherries, hawthorn, dogwoods. Um, different uh, wild grapes, berries, mulberries. Um, the mul our mulberries tend to get pretty picked over. But, um, you know, winter berries. Uh, winter berries are beautiful bush and gets these kind of bright pinkish purple, purple berries. Um, some holly, different vines, you know, put in some grapes, some domestic grapes. Uh, just again, providing that food source. Um, but they will eat suet crumbles, um, unsalted crushed or grated peanuts, raisins, mealworms, um, fresh fruit like apples. And so again, if it's really cold, you know, you're going to be replacing these things periodically, but, um, you know, throw, throw them out in a place where you're going to see them. 
Um, it's, they're not gonna find it right away, but they will find it. So if you've been seeing robins in your yard, clear a spot in the ground, set up a platform for them, uh, and put these things out, you know, see what, see what they like, see what works. And don't give up. Um, I'm gonna try this this winter, because we, we always see robins, I've never really thought that much about them. I've just, you know, they're eating from the crab apples, they're on their own, but I wanna see how hard they are to get to come into some food. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a try the mealworms um, and some of the ground suet. See what happens. Um, the best thing to do too is, is place it near, um, again, where you're seeing them in a tree, someplace that has shelter. Um, cedar waxwings will also visit the fruit that um, you put out for the robins. So if you're seeing a lot of cedar waxwings in your yard over the winter, this is another possibility. See, that's the thing. There's, there's always somebody who's going to be eating these things. Um, and bluebirds, uh, the best foods to feed bluebirds in the winter, fruit, mealworms, whole sunflower seeds, peanut butter, and suet. Um, bluebirds will readily accept these five foods in the winter when insects are harder to find. Um, the high calorie density of these foods helps them survive the harsh winter um, conditions. And that's from Bluebird Landlord. Um, so set up a platform feeder or hanging bluebird feeder um, near a bluebird nesting box. So if you've got bluebirds nesting in your yard, if you're seeing them regularly, then put the food stations up where you see them. Um, we've got bluebird nesting boxes quite a ways from the house, but I'm gonna give it a try this winter, throw some food out for them and see what happens. Probably the mealworms, because I think the raccoons and um, the other critters that might be roaming around are less likely to eat some of the mealworms and provide them a little bit of shelter. Christian. Looking forward to winter. All these different. Well, what? <laughs> <laughs> ish, ish. I'm, I'm ishy looking forward to winter to feed the different birds and to see what they have. Okay, so some tips for happy, healthy birds. Provide a clean water source. Um, there are a lot of different plug in um, bird baths, um, things that will have like a trickling device or, you know, that vibrate to keep the water clear. Um, you can put out small dishes have them freeze, dump the ice, you know, just kind of swap them out if you want. Um, I don't provide a water source because we've got a lake that's got um, open water because it's spring fed. And so I, sometimes I'll put out dishes if, you know, that gets a little bit uh, closed up. For the most part, they have a pretty solid open, open spot, but provide them water, provide cover, um, you know, brush pile, keep your garden waste, um, put up extra bird houses for roosting, little, like little bird warming houses for them. Um, keep the feeder areas clean, you know, kind of rake them out, shovel them out. Um, you know, it, it keeps some of the uh, vermin down if you don't want the vermin coming in, although vermin provides food for great horned owls, so it's, you know, it's a draw. But it, it helps just keep the birds a little bit healthier. So you know, just go out and if you're using thistle seed especially, that's the messiest one, shovel it up. If you're using, using things like um, no waste food, and this is where, you know, kind of jumping to my final point, when buying food out for premium that is 50% sunflower seed, cheaper blends often provide the um, white pros and millet that the birds won't eat. That keeps the weight that waste down. I buy the, um, the, the uh, no waste, bird seed. It's more expensive, but it seems to la actually last longer. Um, it's, there is less waste, um, and then I'll do mix it with sunflower seed in the winter, and that way it provides a nice blend, and then I'll have different feeders where I'm just putting sunflower seeds out too. But that keeps some of the waste. Sunflower seed will blow away a little bit, but keeps it keeps it down. Um, keep the feeders clean. Clean them out. Make sure they don't get wet. I think it's a, that, that's especially important in the fall as we're kind of switching over um, keep bird feeders a safe distance from the windows, um, either less than three feet or greater than 30 feet. I break this one. Uh, my feeders are about 20 feet away from the house and we do get quite a bit of um, bird kill. Uh, it's just where I happened to put the feeders before I learned that this was where you're supposed to put the feeders. Um, so to compensate for that, I um, it's not just my laziness, I don't clean the windows very often. 
Um, the dog nose prints do seem to work really well with keeping some of the burden away. Um, you can get those little stickers and decals and things like that to help, you know, help the birds sort of see where they're going, um, just to help prevent some of the bird, co bird um, collision. And again, the 30 feet, you know, is a lot of times dependent on, on yard space as well. So, um, you know, put it at a safe distance if you're seeing birds hitting the house. Uh, and again, it's, you know, it's, it is inevitable. Um, you're going to get the occasional, but um, put up some stickers. I've had some people have good luck with different ribbon, ribbons, different reflective strings. Um, some people will use the holiday decorations that you put on the windows just to kind of keep them from crashing. And then final thought, feeding birds in the fall and winter is a great way to learn about the birds in your area and their needs. Use the eBird app. Um, if you have any questions about the eBird app after this, after we're done here, I'll be happy to field any questions. Um, it helps you, you know, like with the golden wing warbler, helps your helps helps the people studying these birds keep track. But it also helps you learn the uh, learn about the birds in your yard, and then you can modify your bird feeding according to who's actually there and, and eating. And then when you go to pick the the different plants to plant. You can choose according to who's coming in or who you want to attract to your yard. And so next year when you start planting, um, maybe cutting down on some of the pesticide use to incorporate to work in more bugs and planting native species to again create more diversity. And plant native species is a way to boost the bird's diet and draw a variety of species and birds and mammals to your yard. Now we've a little side note We've been doing this on our property for probably close to 20 years, planting a lot of different species. My husband uses this as for his quality deer management, but we've also done a lot to improve the land for, for pheasants and for songbirds. And you know, we've been putting in different plots for pollinators. And it's taken time to get you know what was once barren cornfields now into you know a lot of different land types and a lot of different diverse um, populations. And, and we were fortunate in this picture here um, is a bobcat in our yard. And so when you talk about diverse species coming in, we were sitting in the house watching the Olympics and this bobcat came through hunting birds and, um, and mice. And then we watched it um, through, with binoculars as it kind of went out into the orchard and, and caught some mice. And so again, you, the, the more diversity you have in your landscape, you just you never know what you're going to see and so we attribute the fact that we have this bobcat and we've seen them before but it's it's been probably 15 years since we've actually seen one we attribute that to again doing all these things over time and thinking long term as well as short term when you're doing the feeding but go long term when you're thinking about some of the major changes that we're going to use better for the animals better for the birds gives you fun things to look at so there you go